Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am delighted to be talking to David Roger Goodwin. David, um, hello, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Could I first of all get you to introduce yourself to our listeners and tell everybody what you do? So, yeah, my name is David Goodwin. I'm currently head of year 10 and year 11 at secondary school in Lincolnshire. I'm a geography teacher and I'm currently, well, just finished writing a book that's due to be published in September, uh, co-authored with Oliver Cavagioli. Fantastic. How exciting. Um, so we um, got in touch because uh, one of my past podcast guests, Kat Howard, uh, in one of the questions which I'll be asking you, um, who would you recommend I interview next and why? So I'm going to sow that seed so you've got an answer. But she recommended you, and, and that's... Um, why we're here. Uh, so let's let's start with that awkward question. Why do you think she recommended you? I think if I remember rightly, because of my northern accent. Uh, but <laughs> she did politely go on to say about uh, my knowledge of, of graphic organisers. And at the time, we'd been doing a little bit of work together on one or two bits and I think trying yeah, to visually yeah. capture some of their ideas and thinking and, and helping her to make sense of it. So let's go straight to the top. For people that don't know and people that are listening, what is a graphic organiser? So a graphic organiser, most commonly, people would be familiar with things like mind maps, concept maps, possibly maps in a fishbone diagram, uh, pop, mm -hmm. something like brainstorming, that sort of activity before. So that essentially is what a graphic organiser is. They go by lots of different terms. So terms like visual tools, semantic organisers have been used. Mm -hmm. And through what man and others work, we, we kind of arrived at our own title, which is, is Weird Diagram. And, and we arrived at that because really what helps users of Weird Diagrams, graphic organisers, what helps them is, is not the, the visual element and no visuals actually need to be present in order to really extract the, the true value out of them and, and we kind of argue in our book that actually it's the physio-spatial aspect of, of using such tools that really ha has the power and the potential to to help people make meaning mm -hmm. now uh, i understand all the pedagogical terms that you've used but c could we break it down any further for maybe a parent listening I, I didn't understand anything David said. <laughs> could you could you say it maybe a bit simpler? Yeah, so I think really, I mean, when we using graphic organisers, what we're looking at is really a tool, a tool to help students when it comes to things like reading, mm -hmm. writing, and, and really help them to not become overwhelmed and and not to become overburdened with complex thinking and it, it's putting thought into the world and, and making sense of ideas because they're visible visually or visibly in front of us and it allows us to organize them as a, as a result of that rather than trying to do all of that internally within our mind which can be very challenging even for the most intelligent sure. and most academic of people um okay so let's um let's ask the question uh, why did you get interested in it so for, like for me, I did an A-level in graphics, so I always kind of had that background as someone that was interested in how visual thinking and, and visual tools might be able to help learning. I'd done quite a little bit of work myself just using things that I'd found from the learning scientists and people like Oliver, yeah. and yeah. I'd been bouncing ideas backwards and forwards uh, with Oliver for, for quite some time and, and I put the idea together that maybe we try to, to explore further mm -hmm. and it's one of his earlier books IQ that was that really mm -hmm. showed me the potential for the use I think one of the one of the things that I see a lot on places like Twitter is people sharing examples of their fantastic work but at the time when I, I started suggesting to Oliver that we, we should look at work and further on this there was very little conversation around actually the process and it was more about the product. And there was mm -hmm. a very few people other than Oliver really, really talking about actually how these graphic organizers are really tools and this is how we can use them to serve the learning process. And that's mm -hmm. one of the, the, the kind of key messages and themes in the book. 
graphic organizers at the learning they are a servant and they are a part of the learning process and it, we mm -hmm. make it very explicit how how teachers can really use them in a practice uh, manner in their classroom so so when's the book out september the 6th i believe is the official publication september the 6th. and without maybe stating an obvious question what's the book title it's called organized ideas thinking by hand extending the mind organizing ideas right we'll come back to that so um thank you that's a great introduction now um what i do with all my listeners is we do a little kind of backstory um, so let's start off with what were you like at school, 16 years old? I mean, I felt like I probably went under the radar a little bit. I did go to a rather large secondary school and I probably needed more pushing than, than I, I got. It wasn't really until I kind of got to college and university that I became truly motivated, I'd say. So I probably mm -hmm. went under the radar. I wasn't bad, um, but I think I could have probably done better at the time. Uh, uh, so, I, can I assume that your homework was always late, or am I being a bit unkind? Uh, possibly a little unkind. It, it probably wasn't <laughs> late, but probably wasn't to as uh, as a higher standard as as I and, expect uh, my students. When did the "I want to be a teacher" conversation start to emerge? In university, I think that okay. was really when I started to think about, yeah, I, you know, this is. And I had a, a couple of friends at the time that were, were also having the same sort of ideas and thinking, and, and it, it sort of kind of spiralled from there, really. And uh, never... how geography, or how did geography happen? I just always had an interest in it. I, I was just always interested at school, and I, I, I seemed to, and I, I started to, I've started to think about this a lot more just recently when starting to work with graphic organisers, and graf, graphic organisers are like, cartography for the mind mm -hmm. and these internal maps that we have and we try to externalize them to make sense of what we're thinking and to really look at different ways in which ideas connect and it's, it's the same with with sort of map reading i remember like when i was really young and, and my mum at the time we'd, we'd make long journeys to um to my, my auntie's house we used to have the old road map I used to, I, and I, I used to be sat in the passenger seat helping my mum. Oh yeah, I, mean, I love doing that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the AA maps navigating from from Grimsby all the way to Winchester, and it's it, it just always felt kind of as a, as a subject. And anyway. Yeah, no, I love doing that too. It's a bit of shame it's all on a uh, on a device now. That kind of physical experience has lost somewhat, isn't it? Now yeah. the the Google just tells you which way to turn. Absolutely. Um, so what, what's your favorite part about teaching geography today then? You know, kind of what's the, what's the state of the subject today? Um, what are its strengths? What do you like about it? What's, what, what are the frustrations? I think I don't, you know, like I don't enjoy teaching. I think it, the, the thing I enjoy most about it is really bringing to the forefront how different concepts and ideas are connected. It's such a richly connected subject and, and there's a real sense of satisfaction when you the, the kind of penny drops for students and they, they can see how the individual pieces of the puzzle sort of interconnect. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently, I think the big the sort of big topic of conversation, uh, especially since Mark Ends is the purpose of the geography curriculum and how sort of like public uh, government policies and public ideologies might be shoehorned into the geography curriculum because there's possibly nowhere else for it to go and mm -hmm. the idea of around decolonizing the curriculum so there's a you know there's a lot of exciting work going on and i think the geography community not to be biased on twitter the geography community is is fantastic like mm. it's and really, so, and, really um how did the head of here uh, head of year stuff happen it's it's a strange one like i've, I've been head of faculty in my previous school and I'd done that for a, a number of years. I was in charge of geography, I was in charge of history as well. And an opportunity to, to, to move to the school that I'm at, at now and to, to work under a previous head. And it, it was such an exciting opportunity in terms of the school. But then also, I just felt like the time was right to try something different and, and broaden my skill set and now, just to just to you know add another strings to the more strings to the bow if you like 
and it's a different sort of challenge it's one that that does excite me uh, it's one that at times frustrates but the young yeah, people no, I was just going to ask you know being ahead of you is a, a tough job at the best of times so what's it been like during covid so I think I, I am I, I am fortunate in that we we I was it is a fantastic very well staffed so in our pastoral team we, we are well staffed at, and have a large staff body it's been challenging in so far as the very early stages trying to to make sure that we made every single student. We learned lessons early on uh, and put into step, put into place new steps and new procedures, which have really served as well. More time spent online has been a difficult thing for students to transition to. So we've mm -hmm. probably encountered more things that students have, have found challenging in terms of not just working remotely, but also their social time and that that's been challenging but mm. you know again we are you know we've learned from that as, as i suspect most schools have but i think really nurturing one of the things i was really keen for when students came back especially this time around was about them reconnect a lot of talk in in the press and in the media about catch funding uh, from my point of view, I just wanted to see young people reconnecting face to face, yeah, yeah. getting opportunities to do things that they haven't done, extra extracurricular activities, for example, and having the benefit of actually person. And yeah, I think that for me, that, yeah. yeah. And, and and I think a lot of young people. I think it was I mentioned this, but there, there was a lovely blog about how young people have made, whether knowingly or unknowingly, have made a lot of sacrifice over the last year. That their education... Yeah, and they have. I mean, I, I can only talk about my son and, he, and even my dog, actually. She's started <laughs> to socialise with other dogs on dog walks, but my, my son's still a bit nervous to go out and do normal things. So those socialising skills, uh, you know, if I think back to the start of the pandemic, some of the things that I was doing or thinking at that time compared to now... Uh, it was, I guess it was that fear initially. Um, but yeah, it's been a very challenging time. Um, now, we know workload is a problem for teachers at the best of times also. And, and I've been fascinated with teacher workload for a decade now. What, what, uh, let me uh, unpick two things. What's the workload issue for teachers right now during COVID? So, you know, context June 2021. And what's your workload headache as a head of year? So... Workload headache at the moment, I suspect for most people, is probably going to be about how do you make up for lost learning in, in whatever. I think no matter how good your remote learning provision has been, in, in my opinion, I, I still don't think it, that inevitably there will be some attainment gap that is that's the attainment gap will have widened and we, and i'm also a an ele for cairo research school and we've been discussing at one of our most recent it's i get the attainment will have widened and there's no evidence at the moment and obviously that sort of research is ongoing but undoubtedly the gap will have widened so i think yeah there'll be a lot of pressure on a lot of people to address what are you going to do about that? Uh, I fear some of the things that are coming out now at, at government level are probably knee-jerk reactions. So the idea around summer school and extending the school day and extending or shortening lunch times, they mm -hmm. all have, they all appear to be knee-jerk reactions. Um, and that's just yeah. me gleaming from the Twitter community and, and people I speak to. Uh, in terms of my workload, it really, do, as a head of year, it really does vary. I probably my busiest spell, I suspect, in terms of where the have just finished up. So the having the tag process, dealing yeah. with things like, so I'm in charge of things like organising the school prom. So um, again, just um, what's tag, just for people that are maybe listening Sorry, outside of education? The, the teacher assess grades. Teacher um, grades. So the the, yeah. the the difference for the traditional exam method. Yeah. So, and 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 I know that's been a, a, a huge piece of work for for every 
person in education at all levels, teachers bringing together that evidence, middle leaders, senior quality assuring and checking that the evidence is robust in case next week students are called and, and work yes. is expected to be provided in terms of evidence for them. So, yeah, I've, I've, you know, June 2021, I, I would probably be in the biggest, biggest workload mm. for teachers. Um, and then, as I said, my, my, my sort of workload varies. It, it can it can change very, very quickly because yes. young people mind, you know, how, how young people are and the, the days that they're having can change very, very quickly. So they, they certainly can. So, uh, yeah, what, what looks like a busy day on your timetable can be uh, uh, days or weeks of safeguarding chasing Absolutely. up, isn't it? It's a, yeah. And I hope you've got some people to support you with that. Um, so let's switch back to graphic organizers um, and let's think about, um, I, I guess a question to pose is, do you think opinion is divided on them? And if so, why? I do. And I'm really happy you've asked me this. I do think it is. I don't think, any, I don't think there's a doubt that people think the work, I don't think that that's an issue. I think the biggest problem that them is again, product versus the process. So we have, mm. again, lots of people sharing ideas, all with all with the right intentions, but very few people talking about actually how they've been used. And then on the flip side of that, you know, a lot of good work. So people like Ferrella and Mayer Learning as a Generative Activity, a fantastic mm -hmm. book. It identifies the boundary conditions of, of using them. So things like the time to construct and the difficulty con to construct. And that can be off-putting to teachers, and, and that can be a reason why some people don't want to engage in them. We then have to factor in uh, icon gate, as, as we've termed it, so the use of noun project and teachers just slapping an icon. You know, that's Joel <laughs> Cogan or, um, you know, this is my graphic organiser. And, you know, that was never really, that, that, yeah. you know, that's not really how they're intended to be used. And... Again, it goes back to everyone. Every, I think everyone has the right intention. Every, everyone just we, we engage in the education community outside of our own school because we just want our students to do well, and mm -hmm. we don't always get it right as teachers. And, and strategies that are supposed to work, we might use them incorrectly. But I'd like to think most you know most teachers learn from that. So I do think the opinions yeah, divided yeah. for. A variety of reasons. Yeah, it, it goes back to that theory and practice. You've got the theory, uh, it becomes popular, or it looks quite elusive, all these nice images, and then we stick yeah. on an icon and I think it's the practice, yeah. but it's not in itself. And, you know, you being a graphic teacher, uh, 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 kind, of, kind of expert or qualified in that area, like myself, the, the process of mind mapping and its place and importance and how it's used is a particular, you know, this is why I've always said, you know, every subject, including design technology, you know, it, it, without kind of going into too much details, my friends used to take the mickey saying you're doing a paper mache degree, but you know, the, you know the, the, the detail and theory of design knowledge as a, a kind of explicit subject domain and how these images can be used to, design great products, communicate through visuals, etc. Uh, you'll know all that. So I guess the question is, um, I've been doing, uh, I'm doing a bit of my own reading and research on memory and I'm using, uh, one of the stories I always talk about is the volcano of Mount Vesuvius in Naples, which destroyed Pompeii. So if we use that as an example, how would you, being a geography teacher, teach volcanoes using a graphic organiser? So I'd have, a, I'd have a few steps. So the, fir the first thing is this. The, there are different types, and the different types are determined by the nature of the content. So, for example, if I wanted to teach the process of a volcanic eruption, mm -hmm. I would choose a graphic organiser that would best depict a sequence. So, mm -hmm. step one, step three, step four, etc. If for example, I wanted to look at different types of volcanoes, the different characteristics, the different features. I wanted to classify information. I'd use a map, use a graphic organizer that was designed for classifying. So there are four different types, and the four types closely, well, are based around 
different nature of how information is delivered to us. So we have information that is chunked, defined, classified, mm -hmm. categorized. It's that sort of language. We can compare information. We can draw connections and similarities. So we have organizers compare. Then we have mm -hmm. sequence organizers, and then we have cause and effect. So my first step, if I'm going to use one, is to pick the right tool for the job. And mm -hmm. the reason they are the right tool for the job is because the structure and the visuospatial relationship between the ideas that are contained on the organizer served by that tool. It's a bit like, and in, in Oliver a lot on his courses, it's a bit like saying my favorite tool is, is a chisel. And it's it's yeah. just such a... <laughs> Silly thing to say because a chisel is not going to be useful if you're going to try and drill and put a shelf up, for example. So the tool, the, the selection of the tool is the most important thing to begin mm -hmm. with. That's my first step. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's it's really interesting and fascinating. I guess, the you know, switching back to the workload issue and the importance and the research behind sketchnoting, you know, if we bring it back to yourself, practically speaking, how do you reshape your resources? And is it a workload issue? How do you avoid icon gates? How do you <laughs> translate your PowerPoints into nice mind mapping sequences to teach the volcano? And, uh, you know, and I'm throwing a lot of questions at you here. What does that resource look like for the kid on the, on, on the table? So workloads, the more, obviously, like anything, the more you use these things, the easier it gets. There is nothing stopping, and here we go, look. Yeah, very good. So okay. for people listening, we can see a little graphic organizer on our screen. This, so describe that to list listeners, David. <laughs> so this this essentially is my, this was me preparing for, for my, my podcast with, with Ross, and what I decided to do was, was simply just, I had all these ideas going from head, and I wanted to chunk them together. So there's a, there's a clear hierarchy of knowledge. We start yeah. off generic in the middle and ideas get more specific as we as we kind of branch out from the center of the mind map so i, I suppose my, my point in showing this is that can be done by hand that that's mm -hmm. the first thing if you've got a visualizer and and i always i i prefer square paper myself just because you've got almost like well you've got a grid so in terms of actually sketching it out it becomes very uh, it becomes easier um mm -hmm. now in terms of like if we go back to the workload argument I think one of the issues, if, if a teachers are unsure about workload and, and, and how to create these, and, and they're, one of their sort of objections or concerns is the time to construct them, you can very quickly create these in, in PowerPoint just by simply inserting a few text boxes and using arrow connectors between yeah. boxes. No, I, I, I guess if you had a... Sorry to interrupt. You maybe have a, a simple template that you could reuse again yes. and again. Yeah, absolutely. Once, once you've created a couple, you, you do have templates that you can use and, and replicate and, and simply copy and paste things. And I have done a couple of, of, of short videos just showing, demonstrating and how I do it. Um, so I do I, I do fully understand what people, you know, people's objections. But, you know, I think... You, I wouldn't expect any teacher to go. All oh, right, I've seen you know, I've seen this strategy, and, and by tomorrow I'm going to be using them in every lesson because mm. they don't need to be used. You know, they don't need to be used every single lesson, and you, you build up that bank of, of resources over the period of time. And once you, as I said, once you have created one, two, you've got a template for uh, future endeavors and use. Now, in terms of what my students get, mm -hmm. it depends upon their experiences with them previously it also depends on if i know for example a student is going to struggle to draw by hand a, a, an organizer i'll put together a template for them and how i do that is once i've created my own i simply duplicate the slide and then i go through and i just delete all the text and mm -hmm. then i've got myself a perfect template for any student that needs that and then the focus actually because, because i think another concern is it detracts because of how difficult they can be or the time it can take to construct them. Some teachers might feel apprehensive and think, well, actually, most actually just spent trying to figure out how to draw an arrow and a line and a box. Well, you know, you can mitigate that immediately just by simply creating a template. 
and it's very simple to do. So what it looks like for the student depends on their learning propensities and, and where they are of in terms course. of their experience of using them. Context is key. Um, Absolutely. So as a pedagogical approach, I will assume that you can use this strategy in any secondary subject as a teacher? Yeah, I think there's, there's some... Because one of, one of the things we've, we've done with the book is we, we have over 50 teacher examples, which it, it, it's just... What we put out on Twitter, you know, different subjects, different phases. Please share your examples because the, the, you know, a concrete example is better than just mm -hmm. me and Oliver saying this is what you should. So lots of different examples in the book. I think the areas where we've probably struggled the most to, to, to get examples was MFL. Um, maths, we, we have had some really, really good examples in particular around how of, of processes is mapped out and how that can be used as a scaffold to help students and then gradually fade that scaffold in and, and take that scaffold in a way that, that really do lend themselves well to geography. I've, we've mm -hmm. got some fantastic English examples as well in the book. So, yeah, I, I, I've seen good examples for every subject. And um, how how is your kind of knowledge or expertise as it's growing being used in your own school with staff training and that kind of technique being used as a strategy uh, more widely? Yeah, so we we last let me think last January was the was kind of like uh, I did a CPD session just prior to the first lockdown, almost mm -hmm. as a, as an introduction to to the idea of, of graphic organising. We've had a big push in our school on metacognition and at the time I didn't really fully appreciate how well connected graphic organizers and metacognition really are. Mm -hmm. So as the as the year went on, unfortunately obviously we had COVID, we came back in the September, I did another staff CPD session and then set up a, a working party, a working group where one representative from each faculty came to a meeting once every half term and would look at different strategies. One mm -hmm use of graphic organizers and then more recently around how graphic organizers and some of the sort of other paired techniques and strategies that we propose can be used to help things like reading mm -hmm. vocabulary practice uh, so that you know that's kind of where we're up to at the moment and yeah. it's, it's been great as you walk around the school you see some some really I good guess examples. The, the key question is do you think it's making a difference to standards I mean, it too gonna, early to tell. <laughs> I'm going to be biased, but I, I, I do, and and I, I think without you know people really seeing a, a, a great example, one of the one of the kind of early ideas I had was, I was, it was with me year eleven September. I had this idea that I wanted my students explicit to my students how what we were currently learning about was linked to what we've learned previously. So was looking at development and stages of development and where countries are. And I wanted to show to students how some of the concepts we were learning were linked to previous topics. So we started off with just a simple table. And the first column was just about retrieving basic knowledge of what we've, what we've covered in the past two to three weeks. And the mm. next column was studied tectonic hazards. How is what we've learned in tectonic hazards, how is that linked to this? And I modelled and demonstrated that. And then we looked at another topic and then another topic. We ended up with, with four topics worth of retrieved information. But what yeah. I felt wasn't going to really materialise here was, yes, students could make the link between what they've learned previously to what they're learning now, but what they would have failed to have seen is all of the other interconnected relationships across the topics. So we produced a concept map mm -hmm. and at the end of it, and, and I've demonstrated to students how the concept map that created could be used as a, for a piece of writing. So, you you know, your concept accurate in nature, mm -hmm. each branch of your concept map is a paragraph. And almost if you follow your concept map class, what you'll notice is each noun and connecting verb helps to create a series of mini sentences. Yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to imagine your classrooms a bit like those classic teacher photographs where you're in front of the board and it's covered in illustrations. Is that <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I, I mean, there's, there's a little going on because I, I don't want any distractions, but there's a yeah. you know, whiteboard 
And I, I, one of the things I stopped doing a, a lot of was making electronic organizers and, and right. the more complex ones I do, but a lot of kind of by hand and, and showing students how to do it because uh, under a visualizer or on the board. Yeah. Yeah. Under a visualizer. And it's, it is an, and, and you know, I won't, I won't deny it. it's an investment in time, but I, I fail to see and, and want students to finish this concept map activity. Mm -hmm. I fail to see any other way I could have got the level and of, interconnected relationships between these ideas i fail to see how any other strategy could do that and mm -hmm. and, and i stand by that and I, and I was i was watching ben ranson at the weekend uh, present at research at rugby and he's a geography mm -hmm. teacher and he uses them as well similar sort of thing just really showing how big ideas and concepts are linked across the curriculum and mm -hmm. i can't mm -hmm. see that retrieval practice low stakes quizzing multiple choice questioning all fantastic strategies, but fail to really help students connect and link ideas together. And I think that's the crux of it, isn't it? Uh, that Those connections. So, uh, David, I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt us because we've gone well over my 20 minute barrier here because we've got really absorbed by the topic. And that's probably my fault. Um, and I hope listeners are appreciated. But what I'm, if you're familiar with my podcast, you may know that I then have a little bit of a a quick quiz at the end and we do i don't know if you're old enough to remember timmy mallet and th that I type do, of approach yeah. but i haven't got the i haven't got the hammer to hit you on the head <laughs> and we're doing this virtually but um let, let me just start off with something easy uh, if i came to grimsby you know post pandemic where where would we go what would we do what would be the highlights of the town well we'd have to go for fish and chips because it'd be wrong not to so we'd have to yeah. go for fish and chips and probably to what they claim to be the world's smallest pub by the old steam railway all oh, right, that sounds fantastic. What a great yeah. day out. Um, yeah. Hopefully I'll get a, a job there in Grimsby soon. I'll be your way. Um, what project are you working on at the moment? What's on your desk? So I'm currently illustrating some pieces, well, some ideas and concepts in Michael Child's new book, which is the, it's called The Sweet Spot. Sweet Spot, uh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. So I'm currently just bringing to life some of his ideas and concepts in his book. Okay, and is your book ready to go itself? It sure is. Yeah, it's it's finished. It's it's with the publisher at the moment, John Cat, and yeah, on course for a September the sixth. And uh, people it's... listening can buy that now on Amazon, can't they? They can. Yes, it is available. Well, fingers crossed for you. Um, what's on your teacher desk today? On well, my teacher desk today is my visualizer, and if I recall rightly, is my visualizer exercise book where we've just been finishing explaining how tropical storms are formed. Okay, fantastic. Um, what book are you reading for fun? Everywhere I get to read. Well, I, I think I, I take, no. I'm going to take that back. Yeah. All of the books I read are for fun. Um, but I've got. A, I'm starting to get a, a pile of books mounting up, and um, yeah. this this yeah. just arrived today. So I'm yeah, yeah. Curriculum to by Ruth Ashby. Yeah. Yeah, I've spotted yeah. that. Yeah, looking, I've got a copy looking, myself. Looking forward to getting to, stuck into that. Um, what would be your piece of advice, your number one piece of advice for a teacher that's, uh, you know, we, we, we hear all the time, I'm not good at maths, and we'll also hear I'm not good at drawing. Um, so what's your piece of advice for that teacher that wants to try a bit of hand drawing knowledge organiser type stuff? So graphic organisers. Um, I would say best piece of advice is to engage with what's out there, have, have a look at what's out there. Engage with the engage with the education community. So many people out there are willing to help and, and support and share ideas with each other. Um, in terms of if you're not very good hand drawing, I have a few strategies. Square paper, mm -hmm. because you get a grid which allows you to kind of help plan it. Sticky notes are a, mm -hmm. if you if you're going to produce something quite complex, sticky notes because you end up I did one hour concept on each sticky note becomes easy to manipulate and organize now I, I, what i will still do this now use lots of sticky notes configure and arrange them how i want them take a photograph and mm. then I'll, I'll sit there powerpoint it and it's so much quicker than right. trying to lots of text boxes on the screen now i'll add a technical question here we're both graphics uh, experts <laughs> what's your tool of choice when you put in pen to paper or pencil to paper so I like a mechanical pencil, and I cannot yeah. remember the name of the one I've got at the moment. I want—I think it's a pencil one, but I like a, a pencil. 
and then I've got, I've got, I can't, can't You've got a range of pens on your table. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, you're doing it proper. Uh, that's good to hear. Um, now, if you weren't a teacher, what, what would be that dream job? Probably would be something to do with graphic design, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, suspect uh, would be. okay, biggest career achievement to date? Most um, proud of. I suppose. I mean, I suppose writing the book. You know, having the opportunity to write the book is 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 definitely up there, and and that oh. opportunity to just to learn and and work with the past year has been, yeah, something that I'm very proud of and and mm -hmm. something that I won't take for granted. What What's your um, biggest hope for the future of the geography kind of curriculum? And this is just, I suppose, again, my opinion. So I think to have more, just more quality geography spread, and, and I'm speaking about my region, but in my region, there is, there's just a lack of just high quality geography teachers. And, you know, mm -hmm. that, that would be my, my one wish. More high quality geography teachers in, in all schools. So that all students have got, a, you know, an Good. opportunity yeah. to... So learn the subject. If you could uh, graphic organise your school culture, give us a, a, a little visual what it would look like. So I actually did do this. <laughs> right. Okay. I Fantastic. Did, yeah, I, I did this just recently, and I can't I can't reveal all of the um, the actual yeah, of course, the yeah. ethos because we're, we're kind of going through a transition at the moment. But it, it was it was very simple uh, in the in sort of like the centre. There was a, a circle, and then coming around the outside was each of the individual statements, uh, yeah, each of our yeah. individual kind of ethos and vision statements, very explicitly communicated, very terse, sharp, clear nice. to understand. I'm glad I asked that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's the question you've you've sowed the seed a couple of times. Who would you recommend I interview next, and why? So I, I had to think about this, and the, the one that sprung to mind was Jennifer Webb, who I believe is Funky yeah. Pedagogy on Switch. Yeah, she is. I know Jennifer, yeah. Um, so I'll get in touch, Jennifer, if you're listening. And, yeah, and why? Um, well, I'll be honest, I haven't read a book yet. A, a new book uh, on metacognition has, has just been released, so I'm, I'm really interested to read it because, as I said, as, as we kind of ventured further into creating our book, we, we do begin to look at metacognition and how graphic organisers can be a servant to that, that metacognitive process. So I'm, I'm going to kind of read the book and, and see what, you know, you know, learn from, from her. Mm. And uh, yeah. Great. So yeah. Jennifer, if you're listening, I'm coming your way. Thank you. Um, so David, where can people find out about you? Connect online? So blogs, things like that. Yeah. So I'm on Twitter at, uh, at Mr. Goodwin 23, which is a, a capital M and a capital G. And then my, website which probably will be changing very shortly um is at the moment it's a wordpress account so it's mr goodwin 23.wordpress i believe okay and if it changes by the time we put this out we'll update that so um and then and finally david what do you um hope to be your legacy i, I, I always have I, I, I just i have a very simple kind of ethos for myself which is if there's a better way of doing something. Show me, and I, I, I'm never, I've never been one that's been precious about how I do things. And if I, I'm not stubborn in terms of if someone introduces something to me and it and it makes sense and it's clearly going to where I'm not going to go no because it wasn't my idea. I'm, I'm just eager to learn and and mm -hmm. continue to grow and continue to learn from people. So, I and and I, why do I want to do that? Because I want to be the you know the best version of myself for the the young people that walk into my classroom every single day and the young people that I that you know Great. I influence um so David it's been uh, it's been fantastic to get absorbed into you know the world of graphics that's right up my street as you'll know um and I wish you every success for the book and uh, I can't wait to get a copy and and be inspired and and get back to my own sketch note and I, I, <laughs> I hasten to add because um it's a skill that I don't use enough and uh it's been nice to talk about the knowledge and depth of of that world uh, and I wish you every success with it. I suspect you'll be a very busy man once that's published and your services, uh, you know, that particularly for school leadership, your sketch note in the school vision and culture is a very useful tool 
to translate you know, those complex visions and theories into a nice uh, nugget of information. So all the best with that. And thanks for your time. No, thank you. And, you know, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and, and keep up all the amazing hard work you're doing during the pandemic. And uh, I know the life of ahead of the year is very, very challenging. So, um, you know, again, I wish you all the best for that and hope people around you are to support you. And uh, all, all the best wishes for the summer. Thank you. Thanks, David.